Welcome to our third Longwood Seminar of 2013. My name is Katie Duboff, Communications Specialist here at HMS. Gina Vild, the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations, is traveling for a conference today, so I'm delighted to be able to welcome you here tonight on her behalf. Um, I've likely spoken with or emailed with many of you about this seminar, so I'm very, very happy to see you here tonight. Um, as I mentioned, this is our 13th year offering the mini-med school program at HMS. And once again, our seminar topics this year were chosen by voting. So thank you um, to everyone who voted on Facebook and by email. We received more than 500 votes this year, which is really exciting. And this particular topic, learning more about the brain, um, was certainly one of the most popular. Tonight's topic is also very timely. Many of you may have seen the exciting news today that President Obama um, just announced a $100 million initiative to study, um, to map the brain, to learn more about the circuitry. Um, so we're really excited about that here at Harvard. And we hope that you will also join us for our fourth and final seminar of 2013, Beyond Belief, exploring the connection between personal beliefs and physical health, which will be held three weeks from today on Tuesday, April 23rd. For those of you who have attended the sessions previously, you're likely already aware of the following announcements, but I'll go through them quickly before we kick things off. Um, if you attend three or more seminars, you're eligible for a certificate of completion. So if you were here for the first two nights and you're here tonight, then you're already well on your way to receiving that certificate, and you'll be able to pick it up at the last session on April 23rd. Um, but unclaimed certificates will be mailed, so if you're unable to attend the last session, please make sure that you leave your address with us um, on an index card or a blank sheet of paper out in the lobby, and we'll, we'll make sure that we mail it to you. We are proud to let you know that we're also live streaming this event as we did for the previous seminars, so we welcome those who are watching online. If you have family members or friends who are unable to get into the seminars this year, we encourage you to let them know that we'll also be live streaming the fourth and final session. Please be aware that we'll be videotaping tonight's session as well, and I want to remind those of you sitting in the front that you may appear in the video. We are also happy to let you know that the two previous videos from this year are already posted on our website and our YouTube channel. So if you missed those sessions, I encourage you to check those videos out whenever you have a chance. You may have also noticed this year that in an effort to support Harvard's sustainability goals, we did not print the supplemental reading packet this year, but you can find it on our website. And if you don't own a computer, then we encourage you to talk to a member of our staff who can give you a handout with local libraries and some information about where you can access the packet. Uh, as many of you know, teachers can earn professional development points by attending all four sessions. You need to fill out an evaluation for each one, and you can either hand that back in to us tonight or you can mail it back to our office. Members of our staff will be circulating um, throughout the evening to collect your questions on the index cards that you received when you checked in. So we're really looking forward to an engaging Q&A later tonight. You may have also heard that we now this year have a mobile application for iPhone and Android devices, which is really exciting. The app features the schedule, the location of the seminars, um, a link to the website to download the materials, and we encourage you to also check that out on our website. As we've done all season this year and last year, we'll be live tweeting throughout the seminar tonight. So if you're on Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation by using hashtag HMS Minimed. And finally, out of courtesy to our speakers and your fellow attendees, please remember to turn off your cell phones, and if there are seats next to you, we encourage you to move in um, to make some room for other people on the aisles. Tonight's seminar is called It's All in Your Head, Building Better Brains Through Neuroengineering. The brain is a fascinating and complex organ, but how does it work and interconnect with the rest of our body? Scientists today are making groundbreaking strides in understanding the circuitry in the brain and, this knowledge, and how this knowledge can be used to repair or regenerate damaged cells. We have many internationally recognized experts at Harvard who are studying this fast evolving field and it's a privilege to have three of them here tonight to share their insight about a couple of ways that the brain impacts our bodies, specifically how the body deals with pain and with hearing and hearing loss. Dr. Clifford Wolf is a professor of neurology and neurobiology at HMS and Boston Children's Hospital. 
Dr. Albert Edge is an associate professor of otology and laryngology at HMS and Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. But first, it is a privilege to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Joseph B. Martin. Dr. Martin is the Leffler Professor of Neurobiology at HMS. He also served for 10 years as Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Harvard Medicine or at Harvard University from 1997 to 2007. During his tenure as Dean, Dr. Martin helped to establish the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, an innovative collaboration which brings together seven Harvard-affiliated institutions focused on diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of cancer. He formed the Harvard Neurodiscovery Center and led the creation of the Department of Systems Biology at HMS. Additionally, in 2003, he dedicated the new research building, the very building where we are here tonight. Dr. Martin is the author of more than 300 scientific publications and several books. The most recent one is Alfalfa to Ivy, Memoir of a Harvard Medical School Dean, which was published in 2011. Thank you all for being here, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Joseph Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Katie, for that uh, wonderful introduction to all of us and to uh, the, the tonight's program. And thank you all for joining us this evening. I uh, understand that these uh, courses uh, that you, some of you have attended many times have been really quite informative and successful over the years. And we're grateful for your interest and attention. And I'm always amazed when I hear how access to this kind of information is available now. You can Twitter, you can put me, you could take my picture and put me on Facebook, all this stuff that um, 10 years ago no one knew anything about. So you've heard the organization of the program. I want to just uh, spend a few minutes, perhaps 10 or so, creating a kind of framework or an architecture for how one thinks about the nervous system before we go into two very interesting and special aspects of the function of that nervous system. And I'd like often to begin with this uh, wonderful picture from Salvador Dali. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. It's called The Persistence of Memory. Uh, if you actually go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, you'll be surprised at how tiny it is. It's really quite a small painting. It's become very famous for the soft clocks measuring time in a way that uh, perhaps our brains attempt to do. Let me begin with the fundamental element of the nervous system, which is called a neuron. And it's a neuron that has given rise to the term neuroscience, neuroengineering, neuroethics, neuropsychology, all of these areas that now are blossoming in our research and in our public uh, awareness. The, may, the, the neuron is, it consists of the following uh, components. You'll see the cell body uh, on your left with the nucleus. Oh, it's like any cell in the body. It has a nucleus where the DNA is stored. It is different than many cells in the body by having a long extension called the axon that goes from the cell body and which ends, as shown by a distributed series of endings in an axon terminal, which we'll see in a moment connects to another brain cell. The dendrites are the receiving components of the nerve cell, and the axon is the output. So you have, in a sense, a generator, an electrical generator, which consists of a body receiving information through its dendrites and then sending them out along the axon to the axon terminal. Here's a picture of what a neuron actually looks like. And you can see the extraordinary complexity of all of the components reaching out here, which are part of the dendritic tree. And this is actually a, a picture that was taken to show calcium uptake when the neuron fires. And you can see here the nucleus featured by the calcium uh, around it. And each of these dendrites has little knobs on it, which are called boutons or synapses which uh, I'll illustrate for you in a moment. In fact, here it is. So if you take this first cell at the upper left, you can see that it consists of connections coming in, the dendrites, the axon, which uh, takes, in some cases, a very long trajectory. And then it tends to end mostly on the finer 
dendrites of the next cell so that the discharge from this cell, which is associated with a, an electrical potential that travels down the axon, when it reaches the synapse, it actually acts through an electrical chemical connection, meaning that as the neuron depolarizes and loses its electrical charge, it releases into the synaptic cleft transmitters, chemicals, which then act upon the post-synaptic area to elicit a, either excitation to turn the next cell on or inhibition to turn it down. And so of all the neurotransmitters in the brain, of which there are probably close to 100 now, uh, they all tend to have either an excitatory or an inhibitory component to regulate the overall neural networks. So brain complexity, uh, more marvelous than the universe. The estimates are that there are 100 billion nerve cells. It's sort of what we spend every year in dollars for Medicare. Uh, no one's counted them. This is an estimate. Uh, there are estimates that each neuron has anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 of those synaptic connections on its dendrites or on its, ac on its axon, uh, meaning that there are between 10 and 100 trillion connections potentially active in the living brain. There are 1,000 proteins that are present in that synapse that we saw a moment ago that can act to modify both the process of release of the transmitter and to act upon the subsequent effects upon the second neuron in the circuit. And very important, as you'll hear from our talks tonight, is that there is minute-to-minute -minute regulation or modulation of the synaptic strength between those cells, uh, which is evidenced in changes in number, in size, and in shape. So that when you leave this lecture tonight, your brain will be different than when you came, unless you don't remember anything. <laughs> you will, in the process of forming memories, actually change the biochemistry in your brain, the wiring that connects the nerve cells to each other, particularly in a region called the hippocampus, which uh, is a change that will live for the rest of your life in modified form. You may forget tonight, but much of what you experience you go on to remember. Fortunately, not everything. You couldn't possibly manage that. So we live with the concept of a wet brain. It, this is not a computer. This is a self-correcting, instantaneously, potentially modifying structure that lives within the environment that it receives information from. And we will tonight hear about two of those information systems. One, the pain system, or the way in which we perceive unpleasant events, and secondly, hearing uh, how we uh, perceive the sounds that uh, are about us. Now, the brain is complicated, and this slide, which is uh, borrowed from my colleague David Cordoza here, who is uh, one of our wonderful teachers in the neuroscience course, shows on the left Vesalius, who was one of the first people to uh, specifically detect and describe all the components of the human nervous system. And you can see that was in 1543, just about 30 years after uh, Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel. So through dissections of humans, he was able to show that the brain, that the nervous system in the human consists of the brain, of a spinal cord that comes down the backbone, and then nerves that go out to the arms and to the legs. And so you can say when you suffer from sciatica, which pain may be felt down here in the foot, that it can be due to some interruption in the function of the nerve fibers up here as they leave the spine to uh, enter into the leg. And shown here on the uh, right is a uh, view of the brain itself with uh, some of the names now shown. The cerebral hemisphere, this would be the left cerebral hemisphere, this is where language in uh, most people resides. Uh, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. And the anatomy of the nervous system, which our students learn in second year, uh, is, of, of course, uh, extraordinarily uh, complicated and detailed to understand all the connectivities that go on between the cerebral hemispheres, left and right, between their connections to the brainstem, to the basal ganglia, and to the spinal cord, and on down to the muscles. 
Now let me just take one little piece. I showed you back here where the cerebellum is. So to give you an example of the intricacy of how the brain is designed, let's take a look at, this, at one cell, a cerebellar Purkinje neuron, uh, which lines a particular layer in the cerebellum, uh, the function of which is to coordinate movement. So that when I take this pointer in my hand and I go up and I want to show you dendrites, uh, that system of, of Purkinje cells in the cerebellum help me aim correctly so that I can actually judge where I want to go and I can put it up there and you know, generally hit what I was aiming at. This particular cell is one of the most complex. Here's a cell body, sometimes called a soma. Here's the axon or the output. And look at the remarkable spread of all the dendrites that are the input for the integration of the connectivities from the rest of the brain that are going to tell this cell how it should respond in relation to a complicated act like a smooth movement to a point in space. Now let's just blow it up, <clears throat> uh, perhaps uh, 10, 20,000 times. Take a little piece here shown by the red circle and look in the electron microscope. And here you will see a dendrite. This is now a single dendrite, one of those spicules sticking out from the cell body from one of the branches of it. And here you can see coming in an axon, which is making connections here to a spine, which is one of the pieces of the dendrite that sticks out where most of the connectivities occur at what we call synapses. <laughs> there are many examples now of extraordinary moments in discovery that relate to the potential for future uh, understanding of neurologic and psychiatric diseases. And I just show you this one, which is from Paper in Science in 2007 by Ken Garber, just pointing out that, again, looking at the proteins that are associated between here a presynaptic axon that's ending here on a postsynaptic cell, you can see the names, they don't matter specifically, but there have been now identified instances of autism with the full spectrum disorder that we recognize in genetic mutations that involve proteins like neural ligand or neurexin, meaning that a defect in the function of a small protein at a synaptic cleft can be sufficient by interrupting the wiring of the systems within the brain to cause a complex psychological disorder like autism. Finally, I just wanted to show you that there are many different kinds of brains within the animal kingdom. Uh, you'll notice here the human brain, uh, illustrated just below the dolphin brain. And the point of this slide is to show you that in fact the human brain is not the biggest in the animal kingdom by far. Uh, here is the size in comparison to the human brain uh, of, the, of the dolphin brain shown here. And a lot of effort now is made in neuroscience to try to understand the behavioral differences <clears throat> that exist between uh, various members of the animal species and ourselves. And I will leave you with the last slide comparing the anatomy of brains in dogs and men. <clears throat> you can read that yourselves. So let's turn now to our first speaker who's already been introduced. Uh, Cliff Wolf is going to tell us about some of the... Uh, you're not listening. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is from another talk. Uh, Cliff Wolf has already been introduced to you, and he's going to tell us something about the remarkable way in which information from a particular set of sensory uh, inputs occur uh, that help us understand, among other things, the nature of pain. So Cliff, I think they'll put yours up right away. Thank you all very much. and. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Katie pointed out, this is a very special day because indeed uh, our president announced this new initiative to study the brain, to spend $100 million. And one may ask, why now? When, why should this be one of our top priorities? And part of it certainly is that the brain is the, the new undiscovered territory. This is 
this is the, the, the new West that we need to discover and understand. That, that certainly is a big drive, and I make no excuse for it, and neither did uh, uh, Barack Obama. He said he, he is all in favor of, of basic science, using uh, modern technology to understand how our brains work, and what, what greater challenge could there be? But there, there's another element to it, and that is what we call translational medicine, which is to exploit the understanding that we get from the study of brain mechanisms for the development of new therapies. And what I'd like to do today is just to give you a flavor of that uh, related to some of the work that uh, uh, we do. And the, the particular challenge that we set ourselves was related to the sensation that we call pain, this unpleasant sensation that we, we feel when we are hurt or sore. And I, I'd like to explain a little bit about what pain is and how we can potentially target pain in a very selective way, in a way that has not ever been possible before. And the, the major theme really is that this new approach to the management of pain is only possible from studying the way in which pain operates. It, and that surely is going to be the answer to many neurological diseases. So if, if we look at the pain system here, in, in, in its most simple, you should by now be a uh, fully trained neuroanatomist. You have no better teacher than the former dean of Harvard Medical School who's uh, pointed out the brain over here. And this is where we have the conscious awareness of sensations. This is our, 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 the, the, the point in which we are aware of a, of, of a sensory experience. And the way the sensation occurs is that there are specialized apparatus in the periphery in, in the, in, at which which uh, have the capacity to convert external stimuli into electrical activity that travels th through the nervous system to, to, uh, towards those centers in the brain that lead to the, this conscious awareness of the pain sensation. So if you imagine a touching something too hot or exposed to a, a flame, this will activate a series of signals that will flow through the brain and will eventually have this particular sensation of pain. Why, why do we have it? What, what is the purpose of pain? Well, pain is an early warning device system. It, it informs us of danger in the external environment. And there are some unfortunate individuals who are born without the capacity to feel such pain, and they, not surprisingly, damage their bodies. When they drink something, they cannot just dis dis distinguish between something that is warm or scalding hot. They, when, when they eat, cannot differentiate between chewing meat or their tongue and which they destroy. So pain is an absolutely essential part of the way in which we are able to safely navigate the external environment. And yet, like any danger system, there are, uh, there, it is there to protect us, but there may be false alarms. And uh, a false alarm is a situation where this pain system is activated in the absence of any danger signal. And that is, in, in some, the, the key element of chronic pain, persistent pain that is warning us of the presence of, of danger that is not actually there. It is a disease state of the nervous system. And what I want to describe to you is how we can potentially target the system in a way that we can control it in, in, in a very selective way. So here, here we, we've learned about neurons, and uh, th these are the neurons that mediate the transfer of information from the periphery to the central nervous system. And in essence, the simplest features of these sensory fibers is that there are two systems. There's a system of neurons that are, I will call, small, and those that are large. The large ones are designed to detect innocuous stimuli, the kind of stimulus that would be generated by touching the skin, by vibration, uh, and what we call tactile stimuli. And so these are obviously uh, do not produce pain. And then the small set of sensory fibers are activated by intense stimuli. These may be intense uh, temperatures, either hot or cold. They may be intense mechanical stimuli, such as pinprick or noxious chemicals. And these activate these small sensory fibers. The information is transferred by electrical activity to the central nervous system, generates activity in ascending pathways to the brain where we now are aware of this, this peripheral stimulus. And the challenge that we set ourselves is, can we switch off this pathway, the small pathway that generates pain while leaving the large pathway that generates innocuous sensations intact? Now, 
if we actually look at what these sensory fibers look like, this is what we call uh, the dorsal root ganglion, and this has the cell bodies, or the soma, a term that uh, uh, Dr. Martin mentioned, of the sensory neurons that I've described. And we have techniques to identify these two sets of neurons. The, the, the small neurons over here are the pain neurons, if you like. These are the pain fibers that are activated by noxious stimuli, whereas the large sensory uh, bodies over there are those that mediate the innocuous sensations. And the, our challenge is, is there a way to target only the small pain neurons, leaving the other ones intact? Now, our, the way we do, we, we try to do this at the moment is to use a chemical called lidocaine. And lidocaine, as you, anyone who's been to the dentist and had, in, had an injection, uh, of a local anesthetic is, is aware of this chemical because it's, it's a very potent anal, uh, 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 local anesthetic. And a local anesthetic means it produces total anesthesia. It eliminates all sensation. And it does this by blocking the electrical activity, the electrical signals that, are, that carry the information from the periphery to the central nervous system. And it does this by targeting a particular protein called sodium channels. And the sodium channels essentially are the batteries within the nerve fibers that carry this information. And uh, this is the electrical uh, signal which is switched off by lidocaine. Now, lidocaine, this is its actual uh, chemical structure, has a, p a p p particular property, which is that at normal pH, it exists in two forms. It exists largely, most of it, in, in our, if, if injected in, into our bodies, in a charged form, a protonated form. And a small minority, about 15% of it, is in, in an uncharged form. Now, why is this important? Well, the, it, it so happens that the site on the sodium channel where lidocaine acts to block electrical activity in the nervous system is on the inside of cells. So in order to gain access to that, the lidocaine has to come from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And it turns out that the only way it can do that is by diffusing through the membrane of neurons. And in order to do that, this is a lipid environment, it, the only form of lidocaine that can do that is the deprotonated or the uncharged form. So you ha I mentioned there was a charged form, which is the majority of the lidocaine, and an uncharged form. Well, it's the uncharged form that diffuses through the membrane of the neuron, gets into the inside of the cell, and then has access to the sodium channel where it can block it and produce its, its uh, effects on reducing excitability of the neuron. So here's a recording from a, a neuron. We have a, a measure of its excitability. We put on lidocaine here, and essentially we switch off immediately the sodium channel activity, and it, the switch off occurs within a, a few thousandths of a second of the application of the lidocaine, and when we switch, when, when you take away the lidocaine, then the activity returns. So this, this effect is, is almost binary. In the, presence, in the presence of lidocaine, there is no activity. In its absence, uh, the activity returns. Now, if we inject lidocaine in, in, in a human or in a, in a mouse, we, we, can, we observe the effects of blocking electrical activity. So in this particular case, we've injected lidocaine to one of the peripheral nerves that uh, Dr. Martin pointed out. And when we do so, there is a, a complete loss of the responsiveness of that mouse or of a human, if you did it in a, in a, a subject, to heat pain sensitivity. So if, if, um, and this effect, uh, the details don't ma matter, but the important thing is to notice this effect is very short-lasting. It, it's very dense, it completely shuts off the capacity of the animal to react to a noxious heat stimulus, but the effect is over within an hour. The same is for pinch, and in addition, there is block of the motor axons, the axons that carry information from the spinal cord to muscles that cause them to contract. So you have a situation where there is loss of sensitivity as well as motor function. The, the, the hind paw of a mouse in this particular instance is paralyzed but the effect is very short-lasting. So essentially, the lidocaine is a very blunt tool. It's non-selective. It blocks the small fibers, which we want, because we want to block pain, but it also blocks the large fibers and therefore causes a complete loss of sensation. And again, 
We go to the dentist, we have our shot of lidocaine, that certainly removes the pain, but you all know you feel numb, and you, you, there's a drooling, and your, your, mouth, your mouth is, is paralyzed because of this non-selective action of lidocaine on all neurons. So the challenge that uh, Bruce Bean, who's one of my colleagues at Harvard Medical School and a postdoc in my lab, Alex Beanstock, set ourselves was to say, could we silence only pain fibers, leaving the low threshold fibers that generate innocuous sensations intact and leaving motor axons intact so that instead of producing local anesthesia, which as I indicated earlier, means a total loss of sensation, whether we could produce local analgesia, which is only a loss of pain sensation. So how to do this? Well, we looked at lidocaine and we said, we know that it exists in these two forms, a charged form and an uncharged form. Well, I've indicated before that the charged form can't get through the membrane. It, it, the, the lipid environment of the membrane is, uh, is not compatible with uh, charged molecules, and therefore it stays outside. And as a consequence, if we take lidocaine and just add on a quaternary amine group over here, which makes it permanently charged, we now have a lidocaine drug that is totally ineffective. It cannot diffuse through the membrane, it cannot block sodium channels, it cannot block excitability of, the, of, of neurons, and therefore it is a completely useless drug. And AstraZeneca, in their wisdom, designed this drug as a potential local anesthetic about 25 years ago and discovered very quickly it was absolutely useless. However, it has a very useful property, which is that if you put it inside a cell, it will block the sodium channels. And we electrophysiologists who study the excitability of the nervous system have a trick. We can put a, 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 an electrode against a neuron. We can then exert a little suction force on the, the electrode, which breaks the membrane over here. You can see it's broken over there. And if we have light, um, uh, this charged lidocaine in the, the, this uh, electrode, it will diffuse from the electrode into the cell. And if you do that, here's the electrical activity of the cell before and then after, and you can see it's completely eliminated. So that this charged form of, um, of lidocaine, which is called QX314, can act provided it's inside the cell, but normally it does not act because it cannot diffuse through the membrane. So the question then we had was, is there a way that we could possibly deliver QX314, the permanently charged form of lidocaine, selectively only into pain fibers? How to do this? How, how to even conceive of a way to do this? Well, we've heard that one of the themes of the, this, this evening's presentation is neuroengineering. And I'm going to introduce a form of neuroengineering that doesn't require a device. It doesn't require any machine or any material. It's a form of neuroengineering that just re requires a good idea. And the good idea was to use what is there already in the body. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to how we feel pain. This is what, how Rene Descartes, a great French ph philosopher about 400 years ago, this is the way, in he, the way in which he saw pain was perceived. Again, you have a noxious stimulus. It acts on, uh, he, he didn't appreciate there were neurons or nervous system, but he knew there was some signal that was generated. He thought that uh, the, the, the conscious awareness of pain occurred like a little bell that rang in the pineal gland. So he, he's, he, he didn't get everything right, but essentially he had the notion that he, uh, noxious heat would activate a sensory flow of information that would cause pain. How does this actually happen? Well, it, this is a, a model of the peripheral end of a pain fiber in the skin. And this pain fiber expresses a protein called TRPV1, which is an ion channel and this ion channel is activated by noxious heat. So when this channel is heated up to a temperature of about 42 degrees, it opens, and that opening allows ions to travel across the membrane, which depolarizes the membrane, generates an action potential, and carries that, that current of information up to the brain. So this is what we call a transducer. It transduces heat into electrical activity, and it does it by opening a channel, which is called TRPV1. Now, the extraordinary thing about TRPV1 is that it's not only activated by noxious heat, 
but it's also activated by capsaicin, which is the pungent ingredient in chili peppers. Now, that's not too surprising. If you think about it, when you eat a very hot chili pepper, and why do we call it hot? It's not because it's actual temperature. It's because the sensation that it generates is one of heat. Why is that so? Well, the answer is really quite simple. Capsaicin activates TRYPV1, which is exactly the same protein that noxious heat does. So the reason we feel that sensation as being uh, hot is because we are activating pain fibers that would normally only be activated by noxious heat stimuli. So now we have a chemical means of activating pain fibers in a very selective way. Now, this is what TRYPV1 actually looks like. This is the membrane. This is the ion channel, and this is uh, shown at an atomic level what this, an ion channel looks like. Now, the important feature, in fact, the only feature you need to know about this is that TRYPV1 is a large pore channel, which means that it has a large hole when it opens up in the membrane. And what our idea, Bruce Bean and, and, and myself, was could we use TRYPV1 as a drug delivery mechanism to get our charged form of lidocaine, QX314, from the outside of a neuron to inside of the neuron? And th that really was our neuroengineering. Instead of using a drug delivery device that was something that was manufactured, our drug delivery device was an ion channel that was present naturally in the body. A ion channel that had a pore that was large enough to allow this small drug-like compound to move from outside the neuron to, to inside. And this essentially was, was the con, con, the, 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 our conception, which is that if we had our charged form of QX314 outside of a nerve fiber, then it would be inactive, as I've described. But if we combined the presence of the charged form of lidocaine, QX314, with capsaicin, which I've told you activates TRYPV1, then the capsaicin would open the TRYPV1 channel, and this pore of the TRYPV1 channel is large enough to allow the QX314 to move from outside the cell to inside, where it can now block the sodium channel over here and produce a block of excitability in, in, in the neuron. But the beauty of this is that this will only work on those cells that express TRYPV1. And TRYPV1 is only expressed on pain fibers that respond to noxious heat. So this, this treatment of combining capsaicin with QX314 will get QX314 only into those pain fibers that are, are noxious heat detectors. So we potentially have our selectivity here. Does it work? Well, we studied this first in cultures of neurons where it's possible to take the neurons, put them in a, in a dish. We have the large neurons, which are the ones that uh, mediate innocuous sensations. And here's a small one, which is uh, a, 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 a pain-detecting neuron. And what we've done here is we've combined QX314, the, charged, the permanently charged form of lidocaine, with capsaicin. In the control situation, we have a measure of the excitability of this neuron, and then we do put on this combination, and in a matter of seconds, you can see the excitability re reduces, and by a minute, it's completely eliminated. So in this small, little neuron, we are able to switch off the excitability of this neuron, and it becomes inexcitable and unable to transfer information. Whereas when we look at the large neuron, which would be activated by touch or vibration, there is no effect whatsoever. It doesn't matter how much uh, QX314 and capsaicin you put uh, in the solution, this does not change the excitability of this neuron because this cell does not express TRYPV1, the noxious heat detector or the capsaicin receptor. So we've got our selectivity by using the differential expression of a key protein that is only present in this neuron and not in that neuron. And Furthermore, we've done this by virtue of the fact that the TRYPV1 has a large pore, so when it is activated, it can allow delivery of our drug only into these cells. Does this work? Well, again, we go back to our preclinical models in mice. We now inject a, a, a capsaicin by itself, this pungent in, uh, ingredient, 
and it produces no change in pain behavior. We inject the QX314 by itself, it has absolutely no effect exactly as one would predict because it cannot cross the membrane of neurons to get inside it. But when we do the combination of the charged form of lidocaine, QX314 plus capsaicin, we now get a very high level of blockade of, uh, of, uh, of in this case, uh, response to pinch. And I mentioned earlier, when you inject lidocaine, the effect is over within an hour. As you can see here, there are this combination effect has a, a duration that is much, much, much longer than lidocaine. And the reason for that is because the QX314 is trapped in the pain fibers. It gets only, it gets, it only gets into the, the pain fibers, but once it is there, it is trapped and has a very long-lasting effect. So this idea, once it was proved, uh, resulted in a paper that the three of us published in, in Nature, which was very exciting. Um, at that time, I was, happened to be in the Department of Anesthesiology at Mass General Hospital, and uh, the, the, the journal Anesthesiology, which is the, uh, the major journal of, of anesthetists, asked the question, is regional blockade of only pain fibers possible? I think our data show that it is. My colleagues were very worried. As anesthetists, this may mean they were put out of business. Well, that's science. <laughs> and the hope is that by understanding the mechanisms of the nervous system, we truly can make a major impact on, on, the, on the treatment of neurological disease. And we hope, in, in collaboration with uh, partners in the pharmaceutical industry, that this conception, this idea, this notion that we can deliver drugs in a very specific way to only specific subsets of sensory fibers to produce local analgesia will turn into a new form of therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clifford, for that uh, great talk. Um, I have some great questions here on cards. Keep the cards and letters coming, and we'll try and respond to some of them. Uh, the next speaker is Albert Edge, uh, who, as you've heard, is at the Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, Dr. Edge first came to Harvard Medical School as a postdoctoral fellow in the 1980s. He worked at the Joslin Diabetes Center for many years, uh, left for a while to become involved in some projects in, in, in the biotech industry, and then came back uh, in 2003 to the Mass Eye and Ear. And his particular interest is in trying to discern effective ways to restore uh, hearing in those of us who have shown the effects of loud noise or aging or whatever uh, by using stem cells. And it's a very exciting area of recent development in the stem cell uh, world. So Dr. Edge. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, I think the Dr. Martin's introduction and Dr. Wolf's talk are, are perfect sort of um, for coming before my talk, because many of the themes are quite similar. We're switching to a different system now, but we're going to talk about the cells that um, transfer information from the ear, the sound information, to, to the brain. And I, I thought I would first start, and this, my, my, what I want to talk about today is also um, what Dr. Wolf called translational, in that I'm going to really talk about some of the work that we've done to um, move towards cures for, for hearing loss. Um, and to set the stage for that, many of you know that, that hearing loss is, is very common, but you may not realize how common it is. S close to 50 million Americans have um, <clears throat> significant hearing loss. Um, around the world, the number is, is closer to 300 or 350 million people who have serious uh, or, or some, some moderate to severe hearing loss. Some of that is age-related, so that in, in older people, this um, hearing loss becomes extremely prominent. 
Um, it's also a problem in, in newborns, uh, genetic forms of, of deafness, which, is, which, are, which are actually um, quite common. Um, and, and, and a lot of that is, is caused by exposure to loud sound. And I'll actually summarize causes here. Um, noise trauma or loud sound is a major cause of hearing loss. This isn't just something that um, parents tell their kids, you know, turn down that, that music or turn down that, that um, iPod. It's, it's a real thing and there's a lot of evidence um, from, from labs around the world showing that, that loud noise really does uh, negatively affect your hearing in the long term. There are certain drugs that, are, that have been used um, to treat other diseases which can actually have a negative impact on hearing. Um, these aren't used so much anymore in the United States, although there are certain diseases in which these antibiotics are used and, and can cause hearing loss, and there are some cancer drugs that can also cause hearing loss. Probably the major cause in terms of numbers of people is, is aging, and I'm sure most of you know um, someone or have a friend or family member who's been affected by that. Um, and I mentioned um, genetic factors and a, and a number of, 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 of diseases which can also cause hearing loss. So what's, what's interesting to us as scientists is that we really understand a good deal about what actually goes wrong when hearing is lost. And so I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes just um, orienting you to the neurons and receptor cells in the, in the ear, which are different from what we've been hearing about, but, but similar in many ways, and then show you about two approaches that we've taken to trying to replace some of these cells. So just to begin that ori orientation, here's the external ear and the eardrum. The middle ear um, is where these bones are that actually vibrate in response to sound waves. But the real action occurs in here in what's called the inner ear, which is actually deep inside the skull. And it's the location of, of the cochlea, which is this kind of snail-shaped um, organ shown here. Um, and which contains these cells, which I'll tell you a bit about, called hair cells, which are really the, sounds, the, the cells that f first um, detect sound. And like the other systems that um, Dr. Martin introduced, um, here's our, our ear again. Um, and through a series of steps and sort of relay stations within the, the brain stem, and then working all the way up to the auditory cortex, um, this sound information is interpreted in your brain so that you can understand speech and music and um, figuring out that a, that a truck is approaching. These hair cells are um, so-called because here, this, these three red cells and blue cell are, are, are what we call hair cells. And if we look at the very top of these cells, they have these structures which we call stereocilia which are hair-like structures. That's why they're called hair cells. Um, but this is microscopic. You can't see this in, unless you're looking through a microscope. And they're connected by little structures, protein structures called tip links. And there are a number of people working on how hearing actually works. And they think that vibration of these stereocilia actually opens a channel, not unlike the trip channels that Dr. Wolf was just talking about. Um, which allow ions to rush in and create an electrical potential. So you've heard this from each of the three speakers tonight, that electrical activity is what that then gets transmitted to the brain. And that happens in the inner ear by transfer of that electrical information from a hair cell. This blue cell here is called an inner hair cell. These three um, red cells here are called outer hair cells. And that, that happens through a synapse, which you've heard about several times today. Um, chemicals are, are released from, from the hair cell, which excite the auditory nerve. And then that auditory nerve leads to the brain to um, bring the information there. And so if we actually look a bit at these outer hair cells, um, these cells are actually like little muscles. They actually um, contract in response to sound, and they actually form what we call the amplifier of the inner ear, whereas the inner hair cells 
transmit the sound um, after it's been amplified by outer hair cells via the auditory nerve um, to the brain. In hearing loss, if we look again at the same sort of cartoon depiction of the inner ear, there are two, two cell types that I've talked about, and both the loss of either of those can cause loss of hearing. So here we illustrate loss of the nerve fiber, and there are some forms of hearing loss in which that nerve fiber is gone, but the hair cells are still intact, and this person will definitely be deaf. And the other type is loss of hair cells. So now we have an intact auditory nerve, but the hair cells are gone. And again, this, this, these, are, these are both called sensory neural hearing loss. The only treatment that we currently have for this type of hearing loss are hearing aids, which most of you know about, and cochlear implants, which are a, a bioengineering approach to um, treatment of loss of hair cells. So a cochlear implant is a device that actually gets um, implanted um, into the skull um, and which detects sounds very much like the hair cells detect the sound and then transmit an electrical signal to the auditory nerve so that that can be communicated to the brain. Now that's all I'm going to say about cochlear implants because our interest is actually not in using devices to try to restore hearing, but in fact to try to replace the lost neurons and lost hair cells. And the way that we do that is by using technology um, which comes from, from stem cells. And so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes um, showing you what, what that involves, and then I'll, I'll basically show you the results of, of two experiments in which we've had some success now in replacing these two cell types. But first, let me quickly um, show you some older data, not, fr not from my lab, but from, from a number of, of publications by others, which illustrate an interesting phenomenon. Chicks, the, the, these, are, these are birds, these are actually young, young chickens, um, will spontaneously regenerate, they'll replace hair cells after hair cells are damaged. So here we see a chicken inner ear. The little white spots that you see are actually those hair bundles that I showed you before. After noise damage, um, after exposure to noise, you can see there's a large area here of damage. And over the course of the next few weeks, those cells are completely replaced, and the hearing in these animals, and this is also true in, in fish, um, is completely restored. The process by which that occurs is, is shown here. These purple cells, uh, this is sort of the simplified ear of a chicken. It's less complicated than ours. So here are the hair cells in the chicken. Here's a hair cell dying. And there are cells underneath those hair cells um, which have some properties of stem cells. We call these actually supporting cells, um, which can go through division. So here we see the, the DNA um, replicating itself and two new cells arising from a single cell. And as we go from left to right here, um, complete restoration of the original structure. So by, by two processes dividing the cell, and then what we call cell differentiation. So we start with these gray cells, and we get a new gray cell and a new purple cell. So in chicks, both of these processes go on. But in humans, and actually in all mammals, this does not occur at all. So once we lose our hair cells, they're not replaced. So I just want to show you again what these hair cells look like in a mammal. So here's this snail-shaped organ, the cochlea. and um, they're arranged in sort of this spiral, but what we have here are this row of what are called inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells. These are the cells that I showed you can actually expand and contract to amplify the sound, and these are the cells that transmit that sound um, to the brain. And when we look at these in the laboratory, we usually use fluorescent markers, and so you're going to see me show these a couple of times so that you can follow me. Um, these are the outer hair cells in three rows with a green fluorescent marker in them. And the inner hair cells, which are shown here and here, also with a, a green fluorescent tag. Now let me just 
spend 30 seconds talking about stem cells and the concept of stem cells. Uh, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with this, that there are various types of stem cells, and I won't go into that today, but what makes stem cells powerful is their ability to become different types of cells, in fact, all of the different types of cells in the body. And so various um, labs around the world have shown that we can make neurons from stem cells, and one way that we hope we'll be able to treat neurological disease in the future is actually to transplant those new neurons into people with, with various diseases. And so in the, I'm going to now show you these, these two experiments that I mentioned, one in which we're trying to replace the neurons and one in which we're trying to replace hair cells. So the, the, the approach that we use for trying to replace neurons was to first, as I said, make neurons from stem cells in the laboratory and then to actually transplant them. And this shows you a little bit about the neurons that we made. You can recognize these now from the preceding information that you received. So here's the cell body or the soma. Here are some uh, axons um, protruding from these neurons. But these are neurons that we've made from stem cells. And this is an experiment we did just to prove to ourselves that these were actual neurons. They look like neurons. And if we measure their electrical activity, they respond like neurons. And so what we've done is to take the, um, these three rows. So now, now the hair cells are in blue here, and the neurons are in, in green. So the brain would be over here on the left, and the ear is over here on the right. And we did some experiments still in a dish in which we first removed the neurons and then added our neurons that we had made from stem cells. And when we did that, we could see that these stem cell-derived neurons sent out these processes, and they seem to know where to go. So they're going to the hair cells, which is where we want them to connect so that they can respond to sound. And we then went, went ahead to try to, to reproduce this in an actual animal, in a mouse that was deaf um, after exposure to loud sound. And so... These animals are, are deafened at, at day zero of this experiment. After a, a little more than a week, we put in the new cells by a surgical procedure. And then we look to see whether we can find the cells and to see whether the cells are doing anything to treat the deafness in these animals. And what you can see here um, is here, here's a mouse ear from a deaf mouse in which the neurons are completely gone. So the hair cells that I've shown you a couple of times are still there, the three rows of outer hair cells, and I hope you can see a row of inner hair cells here. Um, these are just the name of the, of the new neurons that we put in derived from the stem cells. And we can see that the, they reproduce the um, pattern of the original neurons and go and connect, in this case, to these inner hair cells. And if we look even more closely here, um, zero in on the place where we would hope that there would be a synapse forming, um, this is a little bit difficult to see, but the blue and the red dot, the, the blue dot is actually in the hair cell and the red cell is in the neuron. And so this is diagnostic for us that a synapse has been formed. So these new neurons that we make from stem cells find their way to the hair cells and actually form synapses. And I won't go over the details here, but this is the way that we measure hearing in a mouse. You can't play a tone to a mouse and ask him to lift his paw when he hears it. So we have ways of doing that, which essentially involve administering a sound to the ear and then measuring the electrical activity in response to that sound. And, and what we show here is that in our um, deafened animals, um, over time there's a, a decrease in hearing and, and a slight increase in improved hearing in these animals where we have transplanted these new neurons. And so this is a first step in terms of neural replacement um, as a potential future treatment for, for hearing loss. And the second set of experiments that I'm going to show you are 
um, to replace the other cell type that I mentioned, the hair cells. And we take a quite different approach here. Um, first of all, we've identified stem cells in the ear. And so rather than using cells that we're putting in from outside, we're actually going to try to stimulate those what we call endogenous stem cells, the cells that are right there in the ear, and see if we can get them to make new hair cells. They don't do it on their own, but we wondered if we could use a drug to stimulate those uh, stem cells in the ear to become new hair cells. And so the procedure here would be actually eventually, we haven't obviously done this in human patients yet, we've only done it in mice, but the idea would be to inject a drug, and we actually do put it in locally rather than um, as a pill for the time being. That's, that's been the best approach. So we put the drug right, right into the inner ear, and then we measure um, new hair cells and recovery of hearing. And just to give you a feel for how this is done, since there are no drugs that can do that currently, we set up what we call a, a screen to look for molecules that might have this property. And the way we do that, um, we can sort of ignore the details here, but we, we set up a uh, reporter, what we call a reporter system, that lights up when we see a molecule that's making a new hair cell. And this is done, um, and the, the concept here is that we're starting with a stem cell, and if we pick, and, and that stem cell can become many different cell types, but we're trying to affect sort of a series of binary switches to end up with, with a hair cell. The way we do that is um, actually using robots to screen through thousands and thousands of molecules. This shows such a robot, this has 384 pins here, stainless steel pins, which uh, dip into a dish with 384 wells, each of which has a different chemical in it. And so we can then use that assay to ask whether any of those drugs are working to make new hair cells. And we found some molecules that, that do that, in fact. And so here again are, is our um, row of of inner hair cells and three row of outer hair cells. When we put one of these drugs on the ear, you see something unusual happens. We get extra rows of, of outer hair cells, and so it looks like this is a drug that actually makes new hair cells. This is in a dish, in a, in a newborn animal, actually. And we did a similar experiment, but actually first damaged some of the hair cells, so instead of three perfect rows of hair cells. You'll see that some of them are damaged here. And we used this same compound and saw that we were getting new hair cells in this experiment that we did in a dish. So we then went on to try this in actual animals, so mice that had been, been deafened, similar to what we did with the experiments with neurons. And again, if we, we look over here, um, this says control, but what this means is that this is the deafened animal. They're, if you just look at these green spots here, these are now the hair cells. So we still have our row of inner hair cells on the top, but a very much disrupted um, number of, of outer hair cells here. And after treatment of these animals with the drug and then waiting for several months, we found a partial replacement, not complete, but pretty good replacement of, of those hair cells. We went on to look at whether these ears could hear, whether we had restored any hearing in those ears. And again, the details here aren't important, um, except that um, what, what we do here, as I said before, is administer a sound and then measure electrical activity. And what we found, this is an untreated, this is a damaged but untreated ear on this side. And you can see there's a change, and this is actually measuring the, the amount of sound that it took for this, for this animal to respond. And so this animal is completely deaf. It really has no response at all. And this animal now does respond to fairly loud sounds. And so we've managed to again, partially restore hearing in a completely deaf mouse. 
this time by replacing hair cells with a drug, and in the previous work by replacing neurons by stem cell transplantation. And just to give you a feel for, for how this might go in the future, and then, then I'll, I'll finish up here, um, you know, how would you deliver a, a drug to the ear? Um, we hope, uh, ultimately, that we would have something that would be a, a pill. Um, there's also the possibility of, of eardrops, which are put into the outer ear. Another way is what we call a trans-tympanic injection, which is an, an injection actually across the eardrum, which can also be done, and that's actually what we did in the mice, and so that's uh, a viable way of delivering a drug to the ear. And ultimately, um, we hope that we will have ways to actually deliver these drugs directly to the inner ear. And so to conclude, um, as I said, we were interested in, in replacing these two critical cell types for hearing, the receptor cells for sound and the neurons that transmit that signal to the brain. Um, and I showed you that, that, that both of these can be lost and cause, cause deafness. And we've now been successful in partially replacing some of the hair cells and in partially replacing some of these neurons. So thank you very much. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Edge to take uh, chairs at the, uh, at the table here, and perhaps we can turn up the lights a bit so uh, you could all see each other. There's some great questions here. And <clears throat> I'm going to start with one for Dr. Wolf, which is really uh, a very fundamental issue about how the brain works and which he is an expert on. The question is, how is the electrical or the neural impulse generated inside a neuron? Uh, as you say, this is fundamental to the operation of the nervous system. And the membrane of, the, of, of, of neurons is this, uh, this lipid uh, structure which separates two environments. Uh, there's the extracellular environment and the intracellular environment. And they have different ionic compositions. And this really acts as a battery. So there, for example, is a, a lot of a potassium um, intracellularly and less extracellularly, and the reverse for sodium. And when ion channels open, when these channels open, such as the sodium channel, this allows the ions to move down their gradient. And these are charged ions. They carry charge with them. And it is this charge which is the electrical, that generates the electrical activity in the neuron. So this is the, the way in which neurons carry information. And um, it, it is the most fundamental property of, of, of a neuron. It's amazing how nature uses simple things like sodium, chloride, and potassium to, to produce all of the activities that we're describing. Uh, for Dr. Edge, this is a very interesting question. Is the sensation of hearing both contralateral and ipsilateral from both ears? Do the neural okay. pathways take information from both ears, and how does that work? Yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe I should explain the terminology to those who don't get that. So contralateral, meaning the other side, ipsilateral, the same side. Um, there are, both do occur. Mostly um, the signal goes to the other side of the brain, so it's, it's contralateral, but there are contributions from, from both sides. So as these ascending pathways, as we call them in the brain, go from the brain stem um, up eventually to the cortex, there is usually crossover of most of the information to the other side. Now, you're not aware of that, and you shouldn't be, because your brain is, is integrating all this, this information, but that, that happens to be how it's set up. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wolf. How would a patient be treated for pain management with QX314 and capsaicin? I example, what, what would be the mode of delivery? So the, the way in which we envisage it being used, initially at least, is, is by injection. So instead of a, a, an injection of lidocaine, there'd be a, a mixture of QX314 or a similar drug. It's very unlikely we'd use capsaicin because um, as you know, anyone who's chopped a chili pepper with a slight abrasion, it produces very intense pain. 
And while the capsaicin and QX together will block pain, there, there would be a few seconds of very severe pain if you injected capsaicin. We have found other ways of opening the TRIP-V1 channel, so we would use a non-pungent TRIP-V1 activator as well as lidocaine, and I would envisage it being used in a post-operative setting, exactly uh, like your dentist does at the moment, except uh, when, when you get the, a shot of this combination, you would only have a reduction of pain, there would be no numbness, and <laughs> it would last for a, a very long time. So if you had a, an abdominal surgery, for example, you would um, have pain relief for, uh, we estimate, for something like 24 hours, which hopefully would mean you wouldn't need any uh, narcotic drugs after the uh, operation, which, uh, um, as, as people may be aware, one of the major uh, uh, problems we have in, in the uh, health problems we have now is, is diversion of, of, of morphine-like drugs and, and uh, drug dependence and drug over, overdose. So if we can come up with a medication that uh, enables us to stop using these morphine-like drugs, that would be a, a great step forward. Uh, Dr. Edge, here's an interesting one. Why uh, am I the only person who has difficulties hearing and understanding when speaking on a cell phone? <laughs> um, I, I, I think for, for people who have some hearing loss, cell phone use is, is extremely difficult. Um, so, you know, obviously it depends on what cell phone you have and how, how good your signal is. But um, for, for people with, with hearing loss, understanding speech is really the critical thing. And, and, and it can be very difficult, especially... Um, usually the complaint is that it's hard to understand speech when there's background noise. So if you're in a, in a restaurant or a cafeteria, you're trying to hear the person across from you, but there's other sound coming in, that, that's one of the first things that um, is lost, the ability to do that when there's a significant amount of, of hearing loss. Talking on the phone is obviously a, a, another problem, and, and actually there are um, speaking about technology, not something that, that we're doing, but um, there are all sorts of new devices for, for the deaf, people who are completely deaf, to be able to communicate um, you know, with um, devices that, that instantly trans give them a text rather than, rather than voice. So there are, there are a lot of advances, I think, in this kind of communication for the deaf, but, but yes, Understanding language is, is often the first um, reason, the first sort of symptom that people notice when, when their hearing is, is, is getting worse. Uh, here's one that uh, is addressed to, to me. How does the brain process short and long-term memory, and why do some people have better long-term memory than short-term memory, or vice versa? Uh, what's remarkable about the sensory experiences that we take part in, in our daily lives, whether it's vision, hearing, feeling, smelling, tasting, those are all taken to the brain in the pathways that you've seen described, discrete, ending in the parts of the brain where those are perceived. If an event has a significant emotional component to it, or is triggered by the impact of how it connects to your everyday experience in more than just the mundane way, you know, getting on the bus in the morning and traveling downtown and getting off the bus and going to work, you, you don't bother remembering that. But if you're involved in an accident on the way to work, you'll remember that. And the emotional uh, aspects of the event will take a process which collects the information from all over the brain, whether it's visual, hearing, smelling, and will pass it through a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which will strengthen the synaptic connections associated with that memory, the visual, the auditory, all the components, and will, in strengthening the connections in the brain, make that memory uh, potentially retrievable uh, at will subsequently. Now, short-term memory fails in Alzheimer's disease sometimes in head injury, uh, sometimes in encephalitis, a viral involvement of the brain, when the hippocampus itself is damaged. 
And that process of strengthening the synaptic connections is taken away. And so a patient with severe Alzheimer's disease has trouble remembering things for more than 30 or 60 seconds, and it disappears. As we age, most of us tend to have a repository of memories that we have thought about over time in many different ways, and they tend to stay around. Whereas the ability to make the new memories, which depends upon the hippocampus amplitude in the energizing synaptic uh, connection, uh, fails. Here is another one. Um, if the pain receptors become selectively blocked during neurologic disorders uh, treatment, will the patient be susceptible to difficulties in everyday life, such as those you mentioned at the beginning, damage in their body with extreme temperature, foods, tongue biting, not feeling symptoms of other conditions? In other words, congenital insensitivity to pain is, is, a, is, a, is an example of that. But how would you take the drugs that you want to use in help uh, make them effective selectively. So, so the, the drugs need to be used in, in, in a context such as post-surgery or uh, during labor, where again, uh, there's, uh, the, the patient would not then be exposed to, to uh, potential danger in the environment. You certainly would not want to switch off the capacity of, of, of the individual to uh, react to noxious stimuli. We, all the time, as we sit here, uh, we, we squirm in our seats, not only because we're bored, but because we feel discomfort, because the, the blood flow to our skin is disrupted, that causes pain, we move, and that, that allows the, the blood to be restored. So these are absolutely critical, and uh, switching off the pain system will have to be done in a, in a very controlled fashion, and only for discrete periods of time. Okay, uh, Dr. Edge, about hearing. In the case of someone with impaired vision or blindness, how do you explain the person's superior hearing ability? Can you attribute it to some physiological change or adaptability? Well, maybe that's a better question for you. This, this, and the reason I say that is this is really a central question. I mean, I think that that is a real phenomenon and that um, the brain recently, uh, you know, within the last 10 or 15 years, I think we've discovered how what we call plastic the brain is. It really is changing. It had been thought that once you had your neurons, that's it. But there's more and more evidence, which maybe Dr. Martin can comment on, that you do adapt, that, that neurons are constantly being made and, and connections are constantly being remade. And so in, in, a, in an event of sensory deprivation from one of your senses, I think that's, I, I don't know the scientific literature on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's evidence that um, other systems can ramp up and, and start to um, have, a, have an even stronger sensory um, um, ability to, to, to react. Uh, I would add two aspects beyond that. Uh, the first is a developmental aspect. If you're born blind, the brain actually develops a larger region that is capable of hearing. If you're born deaf, the brain has a larger area physically uh, for vision. Now, does that happen in the adult? Yes. Uh, experiments have shown in the somatosensory or the feeling system that uh, Dr. Wolf spoke of, that if you interrupt the input from, say, a uh, part of the hand, this has done, been done in monkeys, this is the kind of work that you can do in, in high primates, and you measure the loss of the input from the nerve that's been cut, and then follow the inputs from the nerves that were not cut right in the same region of the hand, you can actually show that they sprout and take over the space that was lost from the nerve that was cut. And Mike Merzenich at UCSF has done fantastic experiments uh, showing that. So the brain is capable of recovery, of restoration of function through synaptic plasticity when specific sensory inputs are, are interrupted. Here's an interesting one. How badly does lack of sleep affect the brain? 
each of us will take a crack at that. Well, um, it, it's, it, it's an interesting question because it, 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 underneath it is the, uh, the implication, why do we sleep? If you think about it in terms of the evolution of, 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 of organisms, uh, where the, dan the environment is danger, where the predators, and yet we sleep, which we, we, we makes us incredibly vulnerable. So what, why do we do it? Why, what, what, there must be something so important that, we, we, that, that it overcomes our uh, need to protect ourselves and, and be aware of our environment, because sleep, in the context of sleep, we switch off our awareness of the environment. And almost certainly it relates to something that Dr. Martin mentioned before, which is the way in which we consolidate our memory, the way we, and what seems to happen is, he's mentioned a structure in the brain, the hippocampus, which re receives mem uh, information during the day, and then when we sleep, it consolidates it. It turns it into permanent changes in the, our circuitry, so we now have a permanent record of, what, of the salient features of what happened in that day. And this is so fundamental that if you deprive an individual of sleep, their behavior begins to deteriorate. And in fact, if you deprive an individual of something like five days sleep, some individuals start to actually die. So s sleeping is absolutely critical for the normal functioning of, of the brain. I, I work in the area of pain, and what is clear to us is that there is a, not surprisingly, if you have severe pain, that disrupts your sleep. But the reverse is also true, that if you have less sleep, your pain gets worse. So there are, when we talk about pain or hearing or uh, any of these other functions, they do not occur by themselves. The brain is a, a very complex uh, organ where there's an integration of activity, and certainly sleep is one of those fundamental common features of, 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 of the brain. Uh, another question which is, is very timely in terms of its importance uh, to patients. What is tinnitus? Some people pronounce it tinnitus, but tinnitus is the usual pronunciation. And why does it occur with vertigo and with loss of hearing? Uh, is this neuro-based, or what is the mechanism? Right, <clears throat> right. so that, that's, that's a very good question. Um, for those of you who don't know, tinnitus is really ringing in the ears. Um, and so someone is actually perceiving sound that's not there. It's sometimes been compared to the sensation that people have when, they're, when they've lost a limb, but they still perceive that the limb is there. So there's something going on centrally. Again, this, um, you know, sort of the theme of today is how, how the information gets from uh, the periphery to the, to, the, to the central nervous system. There's something that goes wrong in the communication between the ear and the brain in tinnitus. Tinnitus is actually very poorly understood. The, the problems of deafness that I was talking about today are very well understood. You know, we know exactly which cells are involved, we know what causes their loss, and so we can work in straightforward ways on, on cures. The, the main problem with tinnitus as a clinical entity is that we really, the, as scientists, have um, very mixed opinions and, and really a very poor understanding of what it is. As the questioner asks or states, this is true that hearing loss often does go with tinnitus. So that's kind of like the phantom limb that I was talking about. It can seem like there's sound even when there is no sound. And, and many patients, these two go together, loss of hearing and, and tinnitus. Um, but there's also people who think that, that and, and um, there's evidence that most tinnitus comes from central mechanisms. It's really that the, the neurons in the brain are, are perceiving sound that isn't there even when there's no sensory, sensory input. And so I would say you know, that this is a case in which before really good treatments for tinnitus will be available, we need to understand better what it is. There, there are a lot of drug trials going on right now for tinnitus. I've heard that some of them are having some limited success in some patients, but um, generally uh, patients often are, are treated with anti-anxiety medications, which can be very helpful. 
Um, different people react differently to some ringing in the ears. Some people, if it's not too severe, can sort of take it in stride. Others are really driven to distraction by it. So, you know, the best, the best treatment we have right now is to try to calm the person down if it's, if it's really interfering with their, with their life. But, but I think that this is an important future area of research that, that really we're not going to make huge progress until we understand it better. Thank you. Uh, here's a very uh, perceptive question. How would mapping the brain, we heard a big announcement today, how would mapping the brain be useful if the brain is always changing? A map is a static representation. Either of you want to comment on that? Well, uh, I, I think the, the mapping, uh, that's true. There's, a, there's an anatomical map, which is uh, the, the connections between the components of the brain. And there's a functional map, which is the way it operates. And I, I, I think the map that was described today that uh, uh, the president announced that the uh, NIH and other bodies are to fund will be aimed much more at the functional side. What, what, are, what are the codes that enable populations of neurons to operate in a way that generates these complex functions, which is um, our capacity to think, to feel, to act? Um, and w what we've managed to do so far is to identify the way that single neurons function. And from that, we can deduce the way that simple pathways operate. What we've been uh, much, uh, uh, what what we haven't been able to do, though, is to look at the way in which tens of thousands of the of the of the very large populations of, of neurons that make up the brain operate together, and that's going to require new technology and, and a whole new kind of mapping. And it's and maybe uh, the map is not the best analogy, but it's it's it, because in the end this map is going to be more like a supercomputer whereby there will be in, uh, very complex, simultaneous operations in, in large networks of neurons, and, uh, it is, uh, and that will constitute this dynamic, and it certainly will be dynamic, functional map. So I'm going to use this uh, set of questions as a kind of uh, move to a different set of topics. Are there specific foods we should eat to maintain a correct protein balance in synaptic gaps? Is there a diet to reduce sodium channel transmissions of pain? Uh, either of you want to please? Yeah, well, that, that's quite an easy one to, to answer. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so dietary uh, supplements may be very popular, but unfortunately most of them uh, do not do not do much more than uh, generate profits for the, the companies that sell them. And certainly there is no miraculous new, uh, dietary food that is, is going to uh, 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 reduce pain. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there aren't natural compounds that do affect pain. I've, I've mentioned one, capsaicin, which activates pain, and morphine, which is extract of poppies, which reduces pain. And no doubt there will be many more, and they are part of the kinds of screening operations that uh, Dr. Edge described, involve compounds from, from, uh, from uh, natural compounds that we, we look to see in which uh, the ways in which they can uh, act on, on, on the nervous system. However, unfortunately, there's no simple dietary compound that is going to switch off the pain system. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I would say oh, it's oh, this this kind of um, advertisement of um, vitamins or foods that can you know restore your hearing or make your hearing better. I think is um, I, I would stay away from that. Uh, this is a neuroethics question, and I think it has a significant uh, intent behind it. Knowing that there is a vibrant deaf community composed of phenomenal individuals. I cannot see your work as any different than the active practice of eugenics. Please speak to the neuroethics of your work to help me and others like me understand how your work is different. Well, this, this is a position that I respect and those of us working in, 
in trying to um, restore things like hearing or vision respect. Um, particularly in the deaf community, there is, in fact, a very vibrant community. Um, and I think the, they are correct in, in not wanting to um, have this, have deafness seen as a disease. And we, we try not to speak of it that way. On the other hand, um, most of the feedback that I get from the general public about the work we're doing is, is extremely positive. Um, that, you know, there are, there, there's a real difference of opinion among the deaf community um, about, you know, whether they actually want treatments to cure their deafness or if they feel perfectly happy the way they are using signing and having a, a community that's really, really based on that. So I, I don't, um, I certainly don't object to that, to that view, um, but, but my, my personal view is that if this is something that, that someone feels can help them, then it should certainly be made available to them. No one's gonna force someone to, to have a treatment for their, for their deafness. Thank you very much for that thoughtful response. Well, that concludes our question period. I apologize to any of you who didn't have your questions uh, selected, uh, but these have been a wonderful uh, collection of the kinds of issues that, that we as scientists and neurologists uh, face. And uh, I thank you so much again for your attention. Have a great evening.